All right, awesome. Um, so yeah, Ted Ted already gave a little bit of the intro. So we've been doing this series for the past few weeks on Transformers. We've gone through a few weeks now, but you shouldn't have any problem if you have skipped the previous weeks. Um, we we do have recordings of the previous ones, so th those are up on YouTube if you want to fill in those blanks. But if if you have that missing knowledge, it's not going to be the end of the world. Um, so the previous weeks we've talked about. Um, intro to transformers we talked about the models and and how you build them um what they look like we talked a bit about the data and the pre-training um so we've got through this step and so now we have a fully trained pre-trained uh bert roberta any kind of different transformer model and so we've shown that whole process now and so the goal of this week is to actually do some fine tuning on top of these models. And I'll, I'll explain in more detail exactly what we mean by fine tuning in a second. Um, so we've got our pre-trained models. We all point us at a few different tasks. So there's a bunch of different things that you can do with transformers. And so I'll, I'll walk us through a couple of them, how you format the data, how you do the training, um, what the inputs and outputs look like and, and all of that stuff. Um, and then we will actually do the training. So we'll we'll run that in a notebook and we'll be able to see exactly how it performs and everything. And then we'll show you like here, look at the pre-trained model that does really well. And then we'll look at a randomly initialized one and show you like how important that pre-training step actually is. Um, and then after that, if we have some time, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, what we could do to, to build better and better models. Um, so that's kind of it for the intro, and now we can get into the actual notebook. Um, I will drop the link for people. Yeah. So that's the link. Um, I'll give everyone a second to open that if they want. So... We've talked about fine tuning, we've talked about pre-training, we've talked about all this other stuff. So actually to, to define fine tuning or training, some people call it different things. Basically the idea is you've got some task that you want to solve. So you want to solve uh, sentiment analysis, you wanna do some sort of classification, you want to do um, output the the quality of a review or something like that there's a bunch of different tasks that you might want to do um, and so what we typically call fine tuning or training is this process of actually um, customizing a model training it to to learn the specific task that we want so the pre-training stuff that we did before was kind of let's instill some knowledge into the model and this step now is let's actually train it to do the specific thing that we want. Um, and so in, in this, there's a lot of different ways that you can end up with a um, data set that, that does what you want. So some of these um, are, are sort of automatic. So for example, you might have some business process and you have a database and you have the corresponding text and some something that's in your database. So my example here is like, one of the first projects I worked on was looking at eBay listings. And so you have the text from the eBay listing, and then you can guess what is the price of this thing that's going to be sold. And so you actually don't have to do any extra work for that. You just pull it from the database and you say, here's all of the prices that item sold. Here's all of the text that corresponded with their descriptions. Um, and then you can just kind of just say, pull this information from the database, and then you have your, your data set that, that you can train against. Um, and so that's kind of easy mode. Um, a lot of people actually have data sets like that, um, but you have to look in the right places. You have to format it in the right way. You need to um, get everything lined up. You might have to do some, some kind of sanity checking and filtering because a lot of times these databases are, are dirtier than people realize. So you'll go in and you'll say, why is it that every item was priced $9,999 or something like that? And you'll find that there's some quirk in the database. So you do have to do some work on these. It's not like you, you expect to have a completely um, perfect data set out of some production environment thing. 
um, you typically have to pull some data, do some massaging of it, and, and get something that you actually want and can verify is correct. Um, so that's kind of the first regime. You you have some data somewhere; it's pretty much ready to train against. Um, and then the second one is something where you have to annotate a little bit, but it's just a matter of verification. So imagine that you run some forum and you have some system that people can flag potentially malicious content or spam or or anything else inappropriate. Um, and so that that is starting to be um, your data set, but you probably have to go in and, and directly verify everything. So you might have to go through and say yes, no on every single thing and choose which ones you include into your training set. So it takes some effort, but not not a ton. Um, definitely more than the automatic approach, though, because you you can't directly uh, rely on on user reports because there there might be uh, people maliciously reporting versus uh, actually posting inappropriate content. Um, and so the the final one is just full hand annotation. So you have some task that you're trying to do. Um, and there's there's just no existing data that that does that for you. It's inside of people's brains, but it's not written down in the database anywhere. So you have to kind of do a manual effort of how do we how do we get this knowledge out of people into some sort of data set, um, and how do we make something that's big enough that that actually is is worth training against? And so people can do interesting things in terms of crowdsourcing or just manually doing the work themselves. Or, um, but often this is very expensive because if you're distilling the the knowledge of some experienced worker, or if you're taking time out of someone else's day and their normal routine, it's pretty difficult to actually win that. Um, so the, this hand annotation stuff is is very, very difficult. Um, and people are trying to find ways around this as much as possible. You, you, you don't want to be in that scenario. You, you can do powerful things, but you have to have a use case that is valuable enough that um, it justifies doing that hand annotation um, effort. Um, so I put this image, this is from Prodigy. Um, for anyone who's familiar with Spacey, it's related to Spacey. It's their sort of annotation tool. And so this is kind of just an example of what a UI might look like for a hand annotation effort. So you go through and you're, you're doing named entity recognition and you highlight the words that have the contents that you want, and then you classify them to the various different things. And then you say yes, no, and kind of continue on to the next examples. And so this is a UI that you might use to actually label your data. Um, and so I'm mentioning all of this because there's lots of different formats that things can come in, or you can start with basically nothing. And so you'll you'll have to figure out that, that process. That's kind of step one is what data do I have? Is it labeled in the way that I need? Can I, can I uh, formulate a, a problem out of this properly? Um, and so that's that's kind of the whole preamble is is where does our data come from? How do we how do we get it in the right format? Um, and then from here on out, it'll it'll be code and and a few examples. Um, so we start how we do in most of the other ones. Ted, you're raising your hand. Is yes, I wasn't one? sure if you're gonna um, comment on just. The potential need for like uh, custom prediction heads. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll look at those. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we'll we'll start with kind of this the same imports that we've done a lot of different places. So we've got our transformers package, data sets, evaluate. These are all coming from Hugging Face, and these these bring in um, the typical things that that we've been using. So I already have these installed, but I'll run it anyways. Um, we can load in some data sets and then we'll also install sentence piece. This is for the, the tokenization step. Um, and so the, the first task that I'll be showing here is the um, sequence classification or regression. So basically the idea is you have some sequence that comes in and then you output a single value. So you just say, um, 
positive, negative, you can do multi-way classification, you can do regression, you can do whatever you want, but kind of the, the, the input is your normal text sequence, your output is something just like one unit um you can do multiple but but for this we'll we'll just do a single output and so for this one we're we're using the rotten tomatoes data set and this is a, a set of movie reviews and so it's basically just positive negative so our final output is just uh two two neurons one for positive one for negative um that's that's all it is um and so to, to start, we load in the Rotten Tomatoes data set um, just using the load data set function from, from Hugging Face uh, data sets. And then we pull in a tokenizer. Um, and for this one, I'll be using the Duberta V3 base. Um, so this is just a, a pre-trained one that's already available. Um, and then we, we initialize our auto tokenizer. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, so this is our tokenizer. We've talked about these in the past. That's basically just the, the, the part that chunks up your words into the correct vocabulary for your model to actually do the processing. Um, here's a bunch of details on the parameters. Um, and then the pre-process function, this is, um, just to basically take in our text and then apply the tokenization with the with the right uh formatting um and then the data collator this is basically when we're doing batches of data we need them to line up so it's it's what collates them um and we'll we'll see this used later um and then here's evaluate. We're finally importing that. This is how we um, calculate our accuracy. So we just we could load in a bunch of different metrics here, but for this, we'll just use accuracy. Um, we import NumPy, and then we this is the actual uh, computation of the metrics. So the um, the evaluate stuff from Hugging Face expects you to have. Um, a certain format of input. So this is just formatting the input before it actually puts it into the accuracy calculation from Hugging Face. So this that's all this um, function is doing. Um, then we take our text classification data set. This is that Rotten Tomatoes data set that we loaded in. And we apply this pre-process function that we defined up here to every sample. So we have um, however many um, different Rotten Tomatoes reviews, and we want to apply it to all of them. So that's what this step is doing, is saying basically, go do this pre-processing to every single row. It's doing it on train, validation, test, all of them together. So you know that you're applying the same process to all of them. Um, and that that's very important because you want to make sure that they're aligned and you're getting the same output from all of them. Um, so we we do this um, this tokenization step. Now we have all of our inputs tokenized and ready to actually pass the model. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is if we look in this data set, we have the tokenized classification. We're looking in the training set, and then we look in the input ID. So this this is the actual tokenized IDs. Um, if you look at this, every single sample is going to start with the one and end with the two. One, two, one, two. Um, and so you might think that that's a little bit odd because um, your your text didn't all start and end with the same word. And so one of the things that gets added on when you do tokenization is it will put a CLS token at the beginning for, for classification. And it does that all the time. Every time it does tokenization, it, it depends on which exact model and tokenizer and everything you're using. But that that's generally the case, that the first token will always be classification. Um, and the, the reason for this is you need some token that kind of aggregates the information from all of the other tokens. 
because if you use the different ones, then you would end up just having the embedding for that specific word, but not necessarily for the whole sequence. Um, so I just wanted to show that these um, this this token ID one is mapped to the classification token. Token ID two is for the separator token, and this is basically saying that it's the end of the sequence. Um, so you'll you'll see that commonly that the the first and last token will always be one and two or or some other ID if you're um, using a different model. Um, so then we actually load in the model itself. And so this is this is one of the important things to note is this auto model thing will load in whatever model you you start with basically. And all not all, but most of the transformers um, have pretty much the same core component. And what you're actually changing is the final layer. So if you want to do sequence classification, if you want to do entity recognition, if you want to do a bunch of different stuff, all that changes is the final layer. You have that same pre-trained core model that will that will be the same. And so this, this auto model for sequence classification, um, there's several different options for this. And just basically saying, um, do auto model for sequence classification, auto model for token classification, auto model for whatever will take your pre-trained model and then put it in the format that you want for the task that that you have. Um, so just one one uh, let's go to data sets. Um, if you go here and you see all of these tasks, um you can go there and you can say auto model for token classification auto model for question answering and then it will format the model in the correct way for these specific data sets so all of these data sets here um, would now be compatible with the question answering model and all you would have to do if you want one is to say auto model for question answering here um, so that's that's just something i wanted to note is you can swap out all kinds of different layers at the end, and then that will um, guide specifically what you're trying to do with your model. Um, so we we tell it the model name that we want. So this is what we uh, did before. So it's Microsoft Deberta V3. Um, and then we tell it how many labels we want. So um, we we could do multiple different ways but in this case we're just doing positive negative so it's two so it's basically saying put a layer at the end that has two output neurons for our two different classes and you can make this whatever you want so you could say i have 500 classes so make this 500 it's just saying put a layer at the end that has the correct dimension so i have 500 outputs or two outputs or or whatever else there um so that's that's all this number number of layers is doing um so then we define our model and we can see all of these facts about it. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to mention is just this diagram here. Um, so we have some of the stuff that I was talking about. So the CLS token is at the front and then you have all of the tokens that actually make up your text. Um, and these all go into the model and then the the way that we've been looking at it before is we have this output at the end and we have output for every single token. So we have the output for the CLS token. We have output for token one, token two, token three. We have potentially 512 tokens if we had 512 inputs. And so that's a full embedding for each. So we, we have 512 tokens. And then if the embedding size is 768, we have 512 by 768 um, output embeddings. That's that's the shape of our embeddings. But we have to take that 512 by 768 and we have to crush it down to just one or, or two in our case because we have positive and negative. So we have to um, do something to, to crush this um, 512 across this axis, across all of the tokens, um, and then we also have to crush the embedding size, the, the 768, down to that that one or two or whatever our output is. Um, and so 
you can do fancy things where you say take embeddings from every single token and apply an LSTM and then that's a sequence on its own. Um, there's a bunch of different things that you can do here. But what most people have found is if you just take the first token, the CLS token, that's actually the most useful because the CLS token attends to all of these other tokens anyways. Um, so the, the way that we crush this uh, uh, temporal or, or sequence aspect is you say, just take the first one. So we went from 512, 768 down to 1768 because we're just grabbing the first one. And then after that, we have 1768, and that can just go through some fully connected layer. So you just have your, your regular neuron layer. Um, and then that 768 will map down to 2 or 1 or, or whatever else. Um, and so um, the, the key here is we're, we're just taking this CLS token, passing it through this layer, and then we're getting our class outputs. Um, and we'll see we'll see in a later example um, different variations on this. So this is kind of a simple one where you're saying just take the CLS token um, and that's all you're using. But we'll we'll see different variations on that later. Um, so we we've seen this training argument stuff and hugging face before. Base, <laughs> basically this is um defining all of our parameters for our training run so we can say where do we want to save our model what learning rate do we want to use what batch size how many epochs weight decay a bunch of different stuff if i actually hover over this it opens up and you see that there's like a whole pile of options that you can do there. Um, so these, these training arguments get passed to our trainer and our trainer is the stuff that actually defines all of this logic of like, how do we actually do the forward and backwards pass and optimization and handle half precision. And we we've talked about some of this stuff in the, in the previous weeks, but um Basically, the trainer is what actually does the training. So you tell it how you want to do the training. Um, and then the trainer kind of puts you down hundreds of lines of code of how you actually do that. Um, so we we give it our model. That's that Deberta V3 that we defined. We give it our training args, telling it how we want it to train. We give it our train data set. So this is the stuff that we already tokenized. We give it our evaluation data set. Um, and then we give it the tokenizer, the collator that we defined earlier that makes the batches for us. Um, and then we tell it how we want our metrics to be computed. Um, and so now we can actually, if I've done this correctly, yep. Um, so now we can see the output. We can see that we're training on 8,530 samples. We're doing one loop across this data. We're doing uh, batches of 16 when we're training. We're going to do 534 optimization steps, and we have a whole pile of many parameters in this model. Um, so this will take two minutes to run, roughly. Um, and while that's going, I can kind of move on to the sec next section, and we'll we'll revisit it once it's done. Uh, so. Um, here, what I have is some code to basically try the model out. So I just wrote some fake text and I said, let's format this and apply it to new data and, and see how it does. And so I just said, the movie was so terrible. I really hated it. And then we'll pass it through and then we'll see what it outputs. And hopefully it, it does the right thing and tells us this was a negative review. Um, so to, to get to actually inputting text, um, we had to do the tokenization again. So we have our text, we pass that to the tokenizer, um, we tell it to return it in PyTorch form um, with Hugging Face. You can do TensorFlow and PyTorch stuff, or you can do NumPy. Um, so it's it's just up to you on the output that you want. I put the data on the GPU, so I push it to the CUDA device. 
Um, and then I actually run the inference. So I have my model here, I pass my inputs into it, and then I output the the logits, the the raw output directly from the from the predictions. Um, and so now we can see that we have a single output uh, because I only gave it the, the single string of text um, and it has two different classes. So class class zero is negative, class one is positive. Um, this should almost be done. A few more seconds. So now it's running evaluation. And so we can see This isn't the performance. I didn't run this step. Mm. So I'm I'm gonna have to kind of <laughs> rewrite the history here. Imagine imagine that this said ninety something percent. Um, so the accuracy and the validation loss and all of that stuff is supposed to be lower. I I screwed this up by having run the previous steps before. So if if you're running this the first time, I would hope that you get something that is yeah. So it, it should be like ninety, like Jerry says. Um, so this this is just screwed up because I I've run the previous steps before, but um, we can still continue on with with this stuff. So we can see that class zero ends up higher than class one. So this is this is supposed to be negative, positive. Um, so this is this is basically saying yes, it got corrected. It it figured out that this is supposed to be a a negative review here. Um, and so the reason that the previous step didn't work is I I ran this stuff where what I'm doing is I'm basically just erasing all of the weights. So before we had the pre-trained weights, those were the weights that had been trained against uh, wiki text and book corpus and whatever else to distill a whole bunch of knowledge in it. And so this initialization step is basically going through and saying, just randomly initialize the whole thing. So then it's it's wiping out all of that knowledge that it gained. And the, the point of this is to do a side-by-side comparison um so with with that uh now randomly initialized we can run training again um there's no point in me running training again because i already did that run basically um so we can we can copy off of jerry's numbers so jerry says that he got uh 0.90 basically um and so we can see that with the pre-trained model, we get accuracy of 90%. With a randomly initialized model, we only get um, 76.5. And you can probably get better results from this if you trained more, if you if you aligned everything correctly, if you tuned some hyperparameters. But in general, um, that just shows how, how powerful that pre-training step is, that you get 15% boost in accuracy and I didn't have to do any extra tuning, really. It, it converged uh, to a better point. It converged faster. Um, just overall got, got a better result. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll skip the second training step because that kind of already got ran. Um, so the next... Um, so with the next uh, step, I wanted to look at token classification. So before we were looking at whole sequence classification um, and um, I'll go back to this diagram. So in this one, in the sequence uh, classification, we only had the single output. So we had an output just for the CLS token. Um, <coughs> um, so we only have the one output from the CLS token. We have one fully connected layer that's applied to this individual token. Um, but you might actually want something that applies to every single token. So what we could do is we could take this same fully connected layer and we could apply it to every single uh, different uh, token. 
So instead of only applying it to the CLS, you could apply it to token one and token two and token three and, and token N. Um, and what this allows you to do is now you have output for every single token. So we have we have the embedding, it goes into a fully connected layer, and then it outputs some classification. And so the example that I'm showing here is um, part of speech tagging. So we have this data set, we can load in <clears throat> and this data is actually uh, tagged in various different ways, but the one that we'll be looking at is, is the part of speech tagging. You can also do named entity recognition and chunking, um, but the parts of speech tagging, it's saying basically this word's a noun, this word's a verb, this word's a preposition, um, whatever it is. And so um, we need to apply it to every token individually because we need output for every single token to tell us what the classification is. Um, so this one runs fairly similar, um, but in this one, we, we tell it, okay, train against the parts of speech tagging. Um, and then we have this data set that we loaded in um, and here are the labels, so I can print off the labels just to show. So here are all of the different parts of speech that it's looking at. I don't, I don't understand what these are, but um, that seems to be in the data set. So there's all these different kinds of parts of speech. They seem to have it labeled pretty granularly. Um, and then we can we can run this step of tokenization again. And so one thing that I want to show in this um, is the format of the input. So the the previous um, the previous one we had actual strings. So we had um, just like the whole text was one individual string, and then we had one label that applied to them. In this, when we look at the input, the input is actually already the list of words um, because we have to label it by word as well. So we have the lists of words, and then we have the list of labels, and those correspond together. Um, and when we do our tokenization, we have to keep that in mind. Um, so this, uh, this parameter is split into words equals true is what allows us to do that. <laughs> so, um, now we're passing it, uh, a list of lists of words, um, and it has to apply the tokenization slightly differently because of that. Um, so that's what this parameter means. Um, and one of the complications with this is now you have your list of words and your list of labels, and then you do the tokenization, you have to expand out your labels to match those tokens. So if you split your, uh, if you have the word uh, uh, Cadillac or something, and it gets split into multiple different parts, um, you have to then go and apply that label to all of the pieces of Cadillac and expand it out. So that's that's what this code is doing. Um, is basically a, a extending that out. So when it gets tokenized, it, it gets the label applied to it as well. So now we have the tokenized data, and then we have a data collator again. Um, this is the same as before. It, it's just set up to, uh, to prepare the batches for us. And then we have this uh, seek eval package. And so this is what we'll do our evaluation with. And then our, our metrics computation. Um, this is just a lot of data formatting, basically saying pull, pull the max out of, out of your predictions. Um, oh no. <laughs> I'm glad it didn't give me a little test or something. And then I proved to be a robot in front of everyone. <laughs> um, so this is the code to compute the metrics. Um, 
you you're just formatting a bunch of data and then you're you're passing it to the seek eval stuff again um they're they're masking off where the negative 100s are and so that's kind of the special the special token label for don't actually do classification on this because it's just padding or the cls token or the separator token or something like that um so this is this is just something that gets excluded um and then you get the output from all of these different things of so precision recall f1 accuracy for example um and so one of the things that you might see in a lot of different models if you if you like inspect their config.json stuff you'll see that there's an id to label and label to id um, mapping and so what these are is basically mappings to let you go between the class id and the class label because a lot of times you'll you'll have your neurons laid out and it's like here's 50 neurons and number 47 lit up really hard so it's confident that it is but i don't know what neuron 47 represents and so that's what this sort of uh dictionary represents it's saying okay neuron zero represents this part of speech tag number 10 represents this um and so this is <laughs> this is what helps you get um actual usable output you can see like specifically this is this class um and so this is actually encoded as like part of the model so that when you actually do prediction you can carry that along with you you don't have to go look up a map of of that stuff um and that's a pretty common problem if you look at um image net and all of the vision stuff that's a problem there too where it's like we have a thousand classes but what do what do these mean um and you have to go find the big lookup table that they've stored somewhere that says class five is cat or something like that um so this is this is kind of a nice way of you're you're just directly making this part of your model so when you do predictions it can output something that's directly usable um so one one thing I wanted to point out compared to last time before we did auto model for sequence classification now we're doing auto model for token classification um we pass in the model name we still say Deberta v3 base um nothing nothing super fancy there so it's kind of cool that we can go in and we can just say we have this pre-trained model throw on eight different kinds of heads do eight different tasks and you didn't have to do a whole bunch of PyTorch code saying, oh, well, this has this uh, output shape and I need that to match up with the new layer. Like it, it just automatically does all of that for you. Um, so it's it's very nice and, and quick to put together. Um, so there's the, there's the model contents. We see this again. So the training arguments, pretty much the same as before. Um, and then we see, I'll run this before I explain all of it. Uh oh, I didn't, didn't run this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so training arguments again, all of this is the same. I'm pointing it at a different directory so I can end up with a differently named model. Um, so we can see that outputs here. Um, and then the trainer doing all of this stuff again, it's the same thing. It's just saying, give us a training data set, evaluation data set, tokenizer, collator, the metrics function that we defined. Um, and then this will go and do its training. Um, this one doesn't, doesn't take super long. Um, and then after that finishes training, we can look at some output from this as well. So this is a different format of model um and so i've got some text here and then we we do the same process basically saying pass the text to the tokenizer that's going to tokenize it and give us some inputs that we can directly um we can directly use um we do we pass the inputs to the model the model gives us its logits its outputs and we can actually look at the shape of that and see how that differs from the previous one that i was kind of walking through um Hmm. 
that one's going to take a few minutes actually um so i already i already have the the output from that so i guess we can just go off of that so basically what this is doing is the the inputs go into the model and then the model has its output um, and that output is going to be the shape of one because we're only giving it a batch of one and then it's going to be the number of tokens so that could be for for this case i don't i don't know 10 or 12 or something like that um <coughs> so it's it's one one is the batch size 12 is the number of tokens that get passed through it and then the last thing is the number of different classes so it it ends up being down here uh 1 by 13 by 47 so we have output for every 13 all, all 13 tokens have output and it's all 47 different classes for each token so we can see um that that we got the shape that we expected um from here um where to go we took those 13 tokens we have 13 tokens that go in and then we output um the 47 different classes for this one for that one for this one for that one for example and so that's um that's how that whole process works um Yeah, I think that's all I have today. Does anyone have any questions or things that they want to probe on in this code? Is that still running? Yeah, yeah, it is. Do you know if there are any other tokens for that first token, that token one? uh other the special tokens like cls are there anything is there anything like for generation or for regression or for some of the other problems or embedding that you might use um that would that would be specific to the model that the cls one is very common it seems like all of them use that um in terms of other special tokens i I'm not aware of of any other ones that you might put there. A lot of people do stuff with prompting stuff like that, but I in in terms of like already pre-trained in, I don't I don't think so necessarily. A lot of what what some are... people are doing is is passing prompting tokens for for all of the different tasks. So they might actually use the same um output but they use different input tokens if they're doing a decoder model. Um, but it, it just depends on their setup. I think there are supposed to be some unknown tokens and blank tokens that you can use to represent things that aren't already in your text embedding. So essentially, there's a way that you can have this unknown token represent all the unknown tokens that it doesn't see there. And then there's supposed to be some blanks where if you want to also fine tune the um, embeddings themselves while training, you can use those. Another thing with the discussion of using this CLS token that was um, kind of being brought up in the chat. So the CLS token, it's kind of more useful if you're fine tuning the task. One thing that people have kind of noticed is if you're taking like a BERT based model without fine tuning it, that CLS token, I believe it was trained on the next sentence prediction task. So what it's doing is it's essentially getting a representation of all the tokens and then sort of slowly tuning them towards next sentence prediction. So if you're not refine tuning that CLS token, what you have is a sentence representation that's kind of adjusted for determining sentence placement, which isn't always the best. So what people have found is if you're not fine tuning your model and you're just using one of the BERT based things, it might be better to just pull all your embedding words themselves and take an average because then you have a better representation without kind of adding in that little spice of the next sentence prediction. So if you're not fine tuning, just a general rule of thumb is you might be better just taking all the words and averaging their embeddings. If you are fine tuning, then the CLS token kind of already does that for you. There's like more research that's also done based on if you should like 
still do that average pooling of all your tokens and fine tune that instead of CLS, or if you should just start with CLS because technically it has some noise, but none of it seemed too, um, too concrete. You know, there hasn't been any significant gains going one route or the other. The, the bigger thing I've noticed is just, it depends on if you're pre-training or if you're, sorry, if you're fine tuning or if you're not fine tuning. And yeah, basically if you're not fine tuning, you might want to just average pull all the words. If you are fine tuning, CLS is fine to work with. Yeah, I, I related to that. I pulled up the, the BERT paper and in the original BERT paper, they talked about that a bit. Um, so when, when that model was first coming out, a lot of people were looking at it and they were saying, okay, we have BERT is this tower that outputs embeddings. What do we do with those embeddings? Do we pass it to an LSTM? Do we do something else to it? Um, and so this is, this is them basically trying various different things. So what happens if we just directly take the embeddings and the, the rest of the model is frozen? Um, so the model is frozen, it gives us our embeddings, and then we train directly on those embeddings. Um, here's what happens if you allow it to train all the way through the depth of the second to last hidden layer, last hidden layer. There, there's various different ways that you can you can do this. And so um, they found that there's there's different ways that you can kind of use the embeddings and all of the different hidden layers and the fact that they're the same dimension every every input and output, um, so there there's very interesting things that you can do there. Most people have ended up just doing the CLS token because it ends up getting very good performance and it's it's much simpler than than these, which can be very heavy weight in terms of like if you're, if you're doing training on top of it. So if I have my custom token types, I guess the input has to be formatted in a special way. Uh, I don't know that there are any, uh, uh, you can't create any custom tokens because uh, the tokenizer is defined by the pre-trained model. If you're using a pre-trained model, it sounds like from what Ryan's saying, they, they pre-train the model and a bunch of classification problems, a bunch of different classification problems. And so they use this classification token in all of those different problems. So it represents that uh, sort of general meaning of the sentence, but it was, it was, it was fine. It was, you know, it was, it was, it was trained on a bunch of very specific problems like question answering or inference or, you know, what's the next sen sentence. And so um, anyway, it's, yeah, I, I guess I meant more like not tokens, <clears throat> not tokens in terms of tokenization, but token types in terms of token classification, token classes. If, if I have custom token classes, then for me to fine tune this model, I would need to make my input like in a special format, I guess. What, what, what do you mean by a, a special token class, a unique new token class? I don't know what yeah. you token class like in this example we had parts of speech as classes oh that's a tag yeah that uh, that's a tag um those aren't those aren't tokens those aren't and they don't they don't there's not an embedding that represents those parts of speech those are just that's just one of the problems that this thing was trained on to do so that's actually contained like the part of speech is contained with the embedding of the word itself in the pre-trained model Yes, yeah, so I know, could add, if you remember, Ryan said at one point he told the model, how many classes do you have? So I think this one had 47 or something like that. Um, you don't need to do any special formatting. You just pass in text like anything. And if you have 47 of them, great. If you have 10, if you're great. If you have five, whatever. So like, let's say you had text that that came from customers and you just wanted to say, is this a complaint? Is this a compliment? Is this a question? And you had, you know, six different categories. There's nothing special you need to format your text. You just have six output classes. Yeah, what I actually mean is that, okay, I have, let's say 47 token uh, tags or classes, right? My, of my own design. I need to tokenize my text and then assign each token you, a class. You need training data. 
Right. So you do need data that says what's the correct answer for this input string, but you That's don't exactly need to format I mean. your string in any way any differently. But my training data has to be in a specific format, right? Your, so to speak, your X and your Y, right? Your X's are all going to be identical no matter what your task, but you're correct. If you have 15 different things that you want to tag each word, technically token, then your Y is going to be numbers zero through 14. But if you have 47, it's going to be zero through 46. And if you only have three, then it's going to be zero, one, or two. Does that make sense? But the shape of your Y doesn't change. It's just the value of that integer or, well, I, I don't remember if it's one hot encoded or not, but but basically it's, you know, right? It's, that's gonna change, but the, the X, your text does not change at all, if that helps. And that, and that's a really unique, that's a different kind of problem than aggregating the meaning of an entire sentence into one set of uh, categories, as opposed to generating a sequence of categories or tags that go with or correspond to each word. That's more like um, the, the, the token prediction problem where you, you, you mask out a word and you try to predict the word in the blank or predict the next word. It's more similar to that, but it's not exactly like that because you actually have access to the token and it's embedding. And so you're just trying to predict the classification of each token based on that embedding of that particular word in that context. So it's, it's, it's not even set up the same way as a classification problem is. It's a, it's a different kind of problem. I just want to, to add to this that Spacey has a very good explanation of what is a tax because they have models which tags each token in the sentence. And so you run the model and you can check what tax you, you got for each token. So it's pretty much like each token has some attributes which you can get out. You can ask if it is, a, if it is uh, just numbers, if it is, uh, does it can, if it is just letters, uh, if what kind of, um, part of speech it is, uh, like noun or verb, what role this word uh, plays in the token, oh, sorry, in the sentence, it could be a start of the sentence, it could be some actual verb, it could be object, it could be subject, it could be pronoun and such and such. So these are the tags you can use for, uh, well, for your sentence and uh, space is very good for instructing them. By the way, the best model is actually Roberta based and it has, uh, uh, I worked with it this summer uh, and uh, they have accuracy of 99 or 98% well, for different kinds of text. So Ryan, it looks like you've got some examples to show like the exact inputs yeah yeah I, I just wanted to show th this is what we start with so we have this list example so it's th this is a sentence and then we have the labels that go along with it and so th this is the format that your data would be in um so your input is this sequence of, of tokens and your output you want it to look like this, basically. So you're saying that the, you want the 22nd neuron to fire the, the highest on this specific token for EU. You want the 42nd to fire for rejects. You want 16th to fire on German, for example. And these map to, so the 22 maps to uh, this one. So you you basically label your data saying this is a noun, this is a whatever, um, for example, and then you see that we have this negative 100, negative 100, and that's because when we actually run the tokenization step, we get the CLS token and we get the separator token at the end. So the, the formatting of the data that you actually need to, to kind of train against something like this is you need your list of text and you need your list of labels and your labels will look something like this, but probably in a more human readable form where you're just saying noun, verb, adjective, whatever, uh, as you go along. Um, so I, I, I think that makes it 
a little bit more clear seeing directly the, the input and output. Yeah, perfect. That, that's the example I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Question about how, how much data is enough data. Um, so that's one of the big benefits of these pre-trained models is you can apply them to new tasks and they'll do much better than you would expect given very little data. So they know a lot about English or whatever language, and then um, you can do only 100 samples or 200 samples or something like that. And you'll get surprisingly good performance because you're just kind of rearranging the model to, to do the specific task that you want. Um, so it, it, it really depends how much data is enough data it depends on your difficulty of task, how, how, uh, what, what your level of like acceptable accuracy is. So for example, some people might need 99 point something percent accuracy. And if you can't get that with 100 labels, you might have to go to a thousand or 10,000 or a million or whatever. Um, so it, it just depends on the task and, and your expectation of it. But in general, these pre-trained models do miles better than you would be able to do. If you only had 100 samples, you would have no shot of, of being able to train a model from scratch because it has to also learn the vocabulary and context and all of that stuff. So you would you would have absolutely no shot with a with a non pre trained model, but with a pre trained model, you at least start moving in the right direction. Any other questions? All right, awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Um, can you refresh my memory? Is this the final in the series or do you have one more session planned? My plan is one more. And so the, the last one will be all about the deployment stuff, how to do inference and, and all of that stuff. Yeah, so one more. Cool. Um, can I do a brief overview? Overview of this notebook as a whole or how to use Colab or I'm not I'm not 100% on that question. <laughs> All right, so, so can we get a TLDR on yeah. what we covered today? Yeah, so the 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 big high level is you have a pre-trained model that's learned about your language and then you fine tune it on specific tasks. So you might want to train it to do some classification or regression, and you might want to do that at a couple different granularities. This notebook is showing you how to load in some data and then train the model to do those specific things. So if you want to do classification or parts of speech tagging, or named entity recognition, that's that's what this notebook is showing. Uh, just uh, out of curiosity, in, in the next meetup, meet will you speak about things like distillation, quantization, and other ways to speed up inference, or is it, will it be just general? Um, I do, I, I have to look at my agenda, what I even planned on. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I have that in my plan. I've, I've looked at all of this stuff for my work. So it's just a matter of what, what people want to see. So it is, you're, you're interested in distillation, distillation and quantization. I yeah. can, I can guide things to whatever people are interested in. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Hey, There's Ryan, a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I had a quick question. Um, more generalist, uh, like, you know, uh, sequence to sequence is the type of thing in NLP. Uh, 
is there an example where the sequence to sequence can be used in a very complicated uh, classification case? You, I mean, sequence to sequence is kind of, I've been having a lot of conversation about these at work. They're, they're kind of interesting in magic because they can kind of just do anything. If, if you've, um, train them on on the right thing they're kind of a, a blank slate where it's like a, a sequence to sequence model could do token classification it could do sequence classification it could do anything you want and it could have unlimited classes and it could do it it has all of these upsides but then you have the downside of you have to figure out how to process that output into what you originally wanted if it is unbounded like that so if you have something that has 10,000 classes, it's possible that a sequence to sequence model could handle that perfectly fine. And you don't have any like ridiculously sized layers or anything like that, but you're at the mercy of it might output classes that you don't even have in your training set or, or stuff like that. It might just completely hallucinate and, and output garbage. Um, so sequence to sequence is, is very cool and very general purpose, but, um, it has the downside of it, it it can also go wrong in in really weird ways that you don't expect okay uh, are there any use cases uh, on hugging face with uh, sequence to sequence models specifically mm -hmm. for see are there I means I, I haven't actually looked at hugging face recently yeah i was i was actually if i had more time i was going to show a summarization or translation thing like Hobbes is mentioning. Um, so in these, you you have input sequence and then you have output summarized text. So it's it's basically saying like, okay, give me a full article and then just convert that into the headline or to the summary or to something else like that. Um, and these doing doing an example around these is not not really a significant more amount of work in this case so you could you could take one of these data sets and you could take uh one of the models i don't know if I have any of those tabs open but you could basically just say okay take the input text and i don't know what the target column is in this yeah actually what Hobbes mentioned translation is a very classic case very uh obvious case for sequence to sequence yeah, summarization would be something interesting, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was something that was kind of on my agenda. I didn't prioritize it because I think that's less common. Um but yeah, I mean you you could um Okay, another question is, uh, is multi-level text classification, are there any models uh, for that in Hugging Face? Um, not that I'm aware of, but you, you could kind of format that as just a variation on the regular text classification. Um, the, the, it, it's all about just the final layer that you place on top of the model. So if you wanted to, you could plug pretty much any layer at the end on that you wanted. Um, so it it's it depends on how you expect that to be formatted, but you you could integrate that with hugging face. You could even do it just as text classification and just say give all of the classes flattened out, or you could do something um actually properly hierarchical. Um but you'd you'd have to write your own custom last layer. But in the end, yeah. I, I don't I don't think that that would be really that hard to do. You're just putting a different last layer on the model. Okay, got it. Or in this case, it might actually technically be multiple <laughs> heads. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, that auto thing is really nice. But in this case, you might actually need to manually define in PyTorch. Here are some some neural networks, um, you know, units that I'm adding to the head of the pre-trained thing. And so maybe you have the different like hierarchical class outputs. And then of course, um, you have to have your your answers, right? Your, your ground truth labels 
in to match up with all of those heads. Yeah, UIUC had a very nice paper on weekly supervised uh, multi, uh, you know, hierarchical classification. Um, I'll have to find that paper. And um, I think another term which comes to my mind is beam search for uh, hierarchical classification, you know, uh, where you actually use the structure of the hierarchy to define that you're not exploring all the different, you know, options basically, because let's say at the very root level, you have 5,000 classes, but a level up, you have only a thousand classes and then a level up, you have only 10 classes basically. So, uh, yeah, I was actually tinkering with this in my last job, but then kind of lost track of that. There was a question about fine tuning versus transfer learning. I, they're they're very highly related. I, I think that Ted's answer is is pretty much covers it on that. We are doing transfer learning here. We we've got some some task, and then so the the pre training knowledge is transferring to this new task. Um, I don't. I, I I could have mentioned transfer learning. I could have phrased it as as such. I just didn't didn't call it out. Um, I typically think of transfer learning as like training on one task and then realizing that that has applicability to some other data set that I want to train against. Um, the way that I've typically heard people phrasing it recently is mostly the pre-training fine tuning thing because they pre-train on this kind of um, agnostic core task that isn't really something that people care about to begin with. So it's just a pre-training thing because it's not even really like a valid useful model until you do that fine tuning step. Um, but I mean, it, it's, it's just a, matter of vocabulary. Okay, I have a few questions. Um, yes, they might, they, um, I'm kind of a beginner. Uh, I'm just self-learning all this stuff uh, right now. But um, so did you actually, were you just showing us how to fine tune a model in Google Collab or did you actually fine tune a model with Google Collab? We 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 actually did the fine tuning in that notebook. So I, I ran the the training step and I showed the model output and and all of that stuff. So is, does that go? Does that um after all that's done is like a one file created after all of that, or is it multiple files in a folder? Um. So we've we've got this directory that has all of our. I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah um so we we've got this section over to the side and so the the directory is is showing the different runs of the model that we did and so the kind of final output is all of these files the main one that's like actually the model is this pytorch model dot bin and then the rest of the stuff is kind of supporting stuff just saying like what what did we do to create this model what's what's the configuration of this model um, what tokenizer did we use and stuff like that? Okay. Uh, but this is this is kind of the the output is this final run that's been saved. So the model's been updated. Okay. Is there like is there like a special program to run that model, or is it is that going to be talked about like in a later um, um, session? You pretty much just need. Python and PyTorch to run the model, but I'll talk about other technologies next week of like, how do you run it faster and more efficiently and stuff like that. But in general, Deployment. you just need Python and PyTorch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if I could jump in um, at the bottom, Ryan could have added a cell and he could just say, I now have this thousand new pieces of text and he could have run through all of them um, the first model, if you recall, it took about two minutes for him to, to fine tune it, which is pretty amazing, right? Like he went through all the Rotten Tomatoes, 
um, reviews that were labeled as positive or negative. And in two minutes, he trained it on that. And it got, Jerry said, just over 90% accuracy on the test data that the model had never seen before. So in two minutes, Ryan got something that was 90% accurate. The second one took a little longer. It took five minutes to train. Um, so we never actually saw it, but it, it did take five minutes to train. Um, so, so yeah, he could have just added a cell at the bottom and said, here's a thousand texts, give me your predictions. And it would have just spat them out in a few seconds. Do, do we know what computers or how many computers are, so this isn't, this is run in the cloud using Google Colab. So we're not, not using our own hardware. We're using Google's hardware Bobby Lee. To, run these, to train these models. Do we know how many GPUs or CPUs are being utilized while uh, fine tuning the model or, yeah. It's it's uh, the the Google Colab specs are are posted. I don't know if I can get it to print that out, um, but my understanding is it's just a single T four NVIDIA GPU, and then it's like eight cores CPU and sixteen gigs of RAM or something like that. It's not a whole lot. Brian, can you just do like a bang NVIDIA SMI? And yeah. See the. Is there a way we can um, pay for like more uh, like computational power in order to fine tune or train a model? You want to pay money, baby? People are happy to take your money. Yeah, you can, or, you um, can, buy, as, you can buy as much money as you got money to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Just have to yes. Google it pretty much. Usually right? people ask, can I get more compute without paying money? But if you're willing to pay money, then yes. There. Right, right. You can even do that within Colab if you want, if you want to sign up yeah. there. Oh, pro, right. Ryan's showing yeah. it there. Yeah. Yeah. The pro ver I pro did, level. I, I did pay for this at some yeah. point, but I haven't used it in a while. But they tell you you get access to higher end GPUs, you get more continuous time, you get a bunch of different stuff with it. Yeah, um, your your sessions last for days, you know, you can walk away or something like that and just leave it run for a day oh, or that's so. cool because that's the thing that i hate most is getting disconnected yeah 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 you know well come on ted don't be cheap dig down and get that <laughs> 10 bucks a month <laughs> no just kidding um yeah and then then from there you can move up and go to uh you know the cloud platform if you really want to really want to build those big bills how how is this any different from um jupiter notebook google collab it is it's, Jupyter Notebook run on a Google Cloud. Yeah. That's pretty much it. It's a That's, summary. Yeah. So I do some yeah, of my stuff local and I do some of my stuff like in GoLab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the difference is, of course, that you can go from, you know, doing it on your tablet to your PC to your, you know, uh, notebook, blah, 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 wherever you are, right? All your files are there and everything. So that's the good thing about it. The bad thing about it is if you've got a lot of hardware at work, you can't access that. Yeah. Okay. I have a general, <clears throat> a general question, if I may, about, about the uh, uh, models. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have reviewed uh classification and token classification well sequence and token classifications mm -hmm. and if i have a case where uh i have spans so there are neither sentences nor uh individual tokens they are almost guaranteed to contain uh of more than one token is there a better way to fine-tune a model than doing token classification yeah, so you you can actually do spans. Uh, wrong one. Um, so that was another one that I was considering showing today. Is if you look at stuff like question answering, I'm hoping I can randomly pick a decent one. Um, um, what What about the NER stuff, Ryan? I think they usually have spans. 
is that the named entity recognition because like like new york city would be a multi-token span that's one entity mm, these are multilingual um that's not a good preview of it um the core point though is yeah there's some data that is represented as spans and you can you can train models to do that maybe squad no um but basically the the way that you handle that potentially is you can continue to do token classification but then you change it so that your classes is um, start of span, end of span, something like that. And then your model will output, here's where I think the beginning of the sequence is, here's where I think the end of the sequence is per token. Um, and then it will it will output that chunk for you. Um, and that that works pretty well. A lot of people have used that sort of method. And so you can, um, and you might even, so you might have uh, start of sequence, uh, class and then in between sequence class and then end sequence class and then it's saying basically um we think all of these words are inside of one continuous sequence um and then i couldn't find any data sets for it but there are data sets that are formatted like that where it's like words 37 through 41 are uh some specific class of something and then you can you can format it like that uh, but it's still using uh, the token classification model. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. 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 It's a variation okay. on the token classification. Yeah. Thank you. I ha I have another question. Um, in a future video, are you going to show running a model and typing an input and receiving output from that model? Yes. I mean, we, we've done that in some form already. So basically, I, I show here, um, I typed in some text, and then I passed it through the model, and then I, I had its, it, it do its business. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely be showing more of that, but I, I have showed that a little bit already. So obviously, if you want a pretty looking web page, then you need that web page ultimately call that little block of code that Ryan has in the whatever that is. I don't see the numbers, but um, 87 or whatever that code block is. Um, so, so if you know front end programming, you just you know have that little block of Python code uh, called from the web page. But I don't know that we're going to talk about how to make it look really pretty because that's really just whatever your heart desires for like a pretty looking web page. Mm. For for instance, this model that you have right now, how much how can you run this on like a desktop computer locally? Yeah. 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 This is not an extremely big model. Okay. And it would run fine, right? Yeah. Wouldn't be yeah. slow. No, it okay. should be reasonable. And again, you know, the training time is one thing, um, but then there's when you actually want to do inference, when you want to make a prediction, right? Um, it's going to be, you know, sub second. It's not going to be like super duper crazy fast. I don't think it's going to finish in like single digit milliseconds necessarily. Um, yeah. So, so like if you're talking about like creating your own startup company then you're going to need some engineers that like know some stuff right but if you're just saying yeah. like hey i want to create a toy app on my phone it's not like people are going to be like spinning their wheels like playing the, the jeopardy song waiting 20 seconds for the answer to pop out it's just you know it's sub second yeah All right, we are a few minutes past now, so we can all wrap up.